Hi, welcome to Gender Nebulous. This is season two, episode six, and we have the wonderful Jesso Thompson from Trans Safety Network and other places. Um, Jess is a legal researcher and a journalist with a focus on trans and disability rights. And Jess has a degree in law from Cambridge University and is studying a master's in law at the University of Leeds. Jess became known to me for our work through Trans Safety Network and some of our other publications as a journalist. So hello, Jess. Nice to have you. Hi there. It's lovely to be here. And uh, I've wanted to get you on the podcast for a while and I know just dead, dead busy. And uh, so finally, we get you to talk about a little bit about your work. So like I said, I, I first heard about you through Trans Safety Network, which was, I think it's just a brilliant resource. And it, and it, because I, I was researching things myself uh, mainly to do with, you know, the anti-trans network and the sort of affiliates. And I was I was reading a lot about Turning Point and people. Like, and I noticed the stuff I was looking at was also on there, but much better researched. And so I thought, well, rather than just write all this stuff myself, I'd be better off reading what is already written before I venture on something. So when did uh, Trans Safety Network sort of come together? So Trans Safety Network basically came together through exactly what you just mentioned. Lots of people by themselves were independently um, doing bits of research into mm. what was going on um, in terms of, you know, the continual attacks we're seeing on trans mm. rights. And so I think it was October 2020, um, a few a few trans people basically got together and said let's make this like a real thing and let's yeah. collaborate um and it's just grown from there really so yeah. i i joined in um early 2022 so they'd already been going for over a year when i when i joined um but basically the idea of trans safety network you know is monitoring organized anti trans harm and mm. we do that by having lots of trans people who have lots of varying different areas of expertise. Mm. Um, so we've got people who um, have backgrounds in like medicine and psychology, we've got people who have got backgrounds in data, people in backgrounds researching like the far right, people who have technical knowledge. Um, I happen to, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, you know, I, I have training in law. Um, and so the idea is to bring all of these very different types of expertise together with one focus, which mm -hmm. is preventing harm against the trans community and monitoring um, the way that the um, the anti-trans movement seeks to harm us. Yeah. Um, so that's basically at the root of what we so do. So would it would it be a, a good way to describe it? Is a is a collective of people who all have the specialist areas, and you you don't really have a kind of a, a structure within. Um, trans safety network but you you all kind of collaborate together is that is that how it works so it's entirely non-hierarchical really yeah. apart yeah. from the extent to which there needs to be hierarchy for legal purposes yeah so a few of us are directors literally for the sense of we're the people who are willing to have our names written on the company's house website yeah okay. um you know uh and we do the basic due diligence that's associated with that um, but otherwise, in terms of our in terms of our research and what we do, it's all collectively decided. Um, mm. And it lots of people work kind of independently on their own little projects that other people then feed into. Um, the structure is probably going to have to develop more as we get bigger, which yeah. is something we are starting to do. Yeah. Um, but in terms of um, how we do our work, it is. Yeah, it's a collective. It's a collective of researchers, all yeah. all working towards one purpose. And how um, how are you how are you funded? I mean, is it is it through donations? I think so. your donations and things like that. D donations. Um, we um, you know, um, in the future, like we're hoping to be able to to do um projects with other nonprofits that are like more traditionally funded and help yeah. help with those. Um, but. You know, in terms of our like running costs and things, uh, uh, all of us are volunteers, unpaid. Um, so it, a lot of it is just to cover the cost of, you know, hosting a website, paying yeah, for me yeah. to travel to London or whatever when I need to, 
cover a train ticket. It's, it's you know, it's that kind of thing. Um, we're 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 run on mostly on the energy of of a, a small group of trans people yeah. who who really want to fight back against um. Yeah. So if somebody, if somebody wanted to donate, they can just go on your website and do it there, can they? Yeah, yeah. We've got a yeah. we've we've got a a, a Kofi coffee. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't know. I don't know how yeah. it's actually pronounced. I said um, coffee usually, but I, I think it's meant to be coffee because it's oh, a right. coffee. I think you buy but, somebody yeah. a coffee, don't you? Oh yeah, that's yeah. the idea, isn't it? Yeah. But I've always called it Kofi. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, they, like, we have that, and and people can donate to us that way, and people do, and that helps us keep going. So yeah, in terms of the, like the success of the pay uh, the website, I mean, I, I, do you find it frustrating that like because there are when I look at journalism now, when I look at because because I'm I'm thrilled to bits when there's a good article about the real situation for trans people, but of the, and it's not and it's not nobody's fault, but it's they're they're very underground and it's hard to get uh, to amplify certain articles. Like I might say send something to something somebody. But if, if it has that byline times, it's kind of rapper, they might read it. And it, it's a shame that it has to be. But do you find that frustrating? And have you, I noticed you've been reviewed by Pink News. I don't really rate Pink News that much sometimes because I find them a bit clickbaity and they do, you know, they don't go into too much detail. But like I was thinking of more like byline times. And there was a re the recent story about the Honor Oak pub. And I found that really frustrating that that wasn't picked up in the way that I perhaps what should have been. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? And... Yeah, so of course it's frustrating. Mm. I mean, it was particularly frustrating for me, given I was the, the person down there. Yeah, that's... Um, and, you know, I think there's an extent to which we cannot rely on um, media institutions to care mm. because they don't really yeah. like um most media mm. institutions if not all media institutions are run for profit yeah um and even the ones that proclaim to be more leftist so you think you know like navarra and bylines and whatever they still have particular editorial agendas that are very often not mm. inclusive of trans people and trans issues yeah. and not not as good at drawing on like grassroots stuff mm. as they should be well they're I kind think. of hierarchical aren't they and i think they have got ambitions you can tell that like Ar yeah. is it aaron bastini he's i mean he was attacked recently and i thought well that was a big story for them obviously it's one of their own and, it, and it, but it made me think well you know this is happening to other people and perhaps there's a very specific reason it's happening to other people and it made me see that disparity a bit more clearly see the problem i have it's like when I've been in the media, it's quite easy to get on right wing t TV. It's quite easy to get on those shows. But see, my approach was I want to get in the way of that conversation. But often, obviously, the topics were complete not they're, they're complete nonsense half the time. Like this thing, this today, just today about the cost of coffee, mm -hmm. and yeah. and and they play to this idea that there's also some kind of outrage. But you know, the outrage is created by them. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I was particularly irked by the Aaron Bastani incident mm. because I think it was horrendous that he was attacked. Yes. Um, and I think the level of outrage that it saw in response was correct. Mm. Um, you know, many from prominent journalists, not just in Navarra, prominent left wing journalists, everyone from like Owen Jones to like Peter Jukes, I think, responded to it. Um, but I, I, I felt hurt. I, I will not lie that I felt hurt because literally a few weeks before I had been attacked by the yes, far right and nobody cared mm -hmm. like in, in, and I know for a fact that um you know many of the people who were commenting with outrage on the Bastani story had been specifically told by other people about what happened to me and had said nothing mm -hmm. and I think you know we have to be honest about um whose lives are more valued and whose safety mm -hmm. is more valued and that's why I think it's important for the trans community to look after ourselves because um, we can't rely on cis people, even if they do proclaim to be allies, to do it for us. Mm. We have to lead this work. I was going to say, because like with Aaron, obviously he's quite, he, he's more well known. So that's probably the reason it's travelled further as a ripple through 
the media, but but there was a very specific reason Turning Point showed up at a drag. That that's the story. It wasn't necessarily obviously the story is somebody is attacked, but the story is bigger than somebody being attacked. The story is that it's systemic, that it that mm -hmm. something else is going on here. That no that people are not look they're looking the wrong way when they're looking at Aaron Bastani. I mean, yes, nobody nobody should ever be attacked. That that goes without saying, but to concentrate on that and ignore real far right aggression people with sticks turning up at a drag show because like there's a there's a shop in manchester the uh, clone zone shop and i know the people were attacked there the, the windows were broken i think there was one story hardly anything in the mainstream press there were, i think the manchester evening news covered it very badly in my opinion but something like that should be mainstream news and it's just a shame that there's just because I, I, I think that might be something else as well going on there. Like local journalists used to have quite a lot of influence, mm. whereas now local newspapers can't survive on the kind of news they perhaps like my where I live in Bolton. The Bolton news is basically just uh, outsourced advertising. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same everywhere, I think, mm. mostly. It's I think we're seeing the death of of yeah. of of media of, of written media as it previously was yeah. understood and you know i think that's expanding to even more like recent innovations in in recent media you know mm -hmm. um the death of twitter is a very good example of this like everything that um i have done in terms of my writing you know i have been given platforms in other publications like i have um I have a lot of gratitude to to open democracy who have platformed mm, like true. my writing um on like very important issues um you know i i do i do think that i was only able ever to make most of the stuff that i write and the stuff i research known through platforms like twitter these these written yeah. media platforms and as they're dying and as we see them move into um people turning to to video platforms like TikTok and whatever, I think there is no way I could have ever conveyed the kind of information I, I want to convey via TikTok. Um yeah. you know, I yes. um I am not a model. Um mm. people will not watch me for that reason. Um and I, I do wonder, you know, if if the the death of of, of written media is gonna end up causing a lot of harm in terms of well, us being able to spread information to each other that just made me think about attention spans that people have because oh, yeah. a lot of the times like i've written some stuff and I, I've, I've actually worked with talk tv and i feel quite dirty for doing that but they were the only people that would give me the counter argument because they'd send me the article and say write something in response to this and I go, at first i thought well is that gonna but i thought yeah actually i'm gonna get in the way of that conversation but they only ever read the headline, mm. and and that and the the headline is always something I didn't write. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. So whatever I've written in the smaller print is missing from the conversation because when yeah. something hits Twitter, it's like oh, trans activist says the the the. But I'm not saying it as a trans activist. Saying it's something that has has recognised a problem in society. <laughs> that is it. Mm -hmm. And that is that a frustration you find that as uh, you get labelled a certain kind of writer because of the trans safety net has the word trans in it obviously so so then people think ah this is an article by a trans person so it must be about just you know the whole thing is about the uh, trans rights which i don't i think it's bigger than that i think it's about human rights yeah um and you know i think particularly um i'm someone who never wanted to do research about or write about trans stuff like my academic interest is always disability like it yes. just always was um but i saw the level of of backlash against mm -hmm. the the trans community for existing mm -hmm. um and as a trans person i felt compelled to you know use my expertise and my knowledge to to try and contribute and it has resulted in um me speaking out on those fields has, has resulted in in pretty much everything else I do and talk about being ignored to some extent and um that's kind of sad yeah um, but it's it's also kind of 
understandable because as I say the, the reason I'm doing this this kind of work is because this is the center of of some of the most um concentrated effort by the right and the far right across the world yeah. not just not just um not just in the UK although particularly in the UK yeah. and so it makes sense that um would I be right in saying it's like kind of an American import as well? Because I've noticed a lot of uh, what would you call fundamentalist, nationalistic, what you would what you would definitely see in America ten years ago. Like, but it's kind of creeped into British politics. I'm sure you've heard of the ADF and, yes. and policy exchange. And these people, they seem to be very well funded by people not from Britain, if I put it that way. So. That, the resources I, especially are, 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 are yeah. definitely coming from America yeah. and yeah. that is also influencing the particular policy lines yeah. um so you know um if you had asked me five years ago if we would see um mainstream commentators in the UK talking about the removal of abortion mm, yeah I would not have believed that that yeah. would be a thing that would happen but the 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 trans rights issue is being used as a wedge yes. to try and open the door to all sorts of absolutely horrifically backwards well, anti-human it, rights policies yeah me and vicky have said this quite a few and our other guests have said that when the um do you know when the fight for um gay marriage was seen in america to have gain traction that's when a, a lot of people mobilized against the trans because uh, the trans issue because it's not that it was it's a new issue obviously it's not a new issue there's always going to be there's always people out there that are never going to accept trans we're not trying to make people accept us we just don't want people to hate us and it's like they they, they they've weaponized I, I i feel like there was never been a, a situation on mainstream tv would would be talking about trans people in prisons because they never talked about prisons anyway. It's like suddenly they're interested in the welfare of people in prisons, where the, the story used to be, oh, prison's easy. You get a PlayStation and everybody's having fun. Suddenly they care about women in prison. Oh, I was like, give me a break. <laughs> so we know we notice these things. And I think is that I I was gonna ask you there something and I, and it kind of went out of my head. Sorry, I was I, oh, obviously you've heard sex matters. So I think they formulated a set of arguments that work as a kind of uh, a tool to exclude trans people, not just from prisons, not because obviously they, they are the issues they can sort of bring people over on, prisons, sports, uh, single sex spaces. But they, they want to legislate to take us out of public life. That's, you know, that's how it feels. Does that feel? I, I believe I everything I have ever done or ever researched leads me to that conclusion mm. you know I, I think it's effectively not debatable at this point they've been quite open yeah. about it yeah. um you know the the women's declaration is is clear that their beliefs are that there should be no trans people that you know then as 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 early as the first um turfs um and I mean I mean that in the in the yeah. actual sense um yeah there was the suggestion that we should be morally mandated out of public life yeah. and you know i think i i don't think that's uh, that's ever um yeah. not been the goal but they've just used varying um tactics and strategies mm -hmm. to um try and try and open open um open the door to bringing in those those kind of more extreme arguments you know things about the sports things about single sex spaces and women shelters and prisons all of these things are really just a trojan horse for us yes, yeah. for a lot of very very um conservative anti-trans mm. anti-queer anti-feminist yeah. arguments yeah, yeah so you, just, just going right. back onto that that point about you know doing you know media things and getting your message out there mm -hmm. um you know, we I think we all have frustrations where we seem to we you know we feel a bit sidelined sometimes we feel a bit ignored. We kind of make our own media. You know, you have a website, we have a website, we have a, 
a podcast, you know, <laughs> things go on YouTube. So we all try and do this kind of, we, we all do our own little things to try and create our own media sources because the rest of them are so bad. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as an organization, do you try to collaborate with other similar organizations? I know there's, there's quite a lot of them. Um, and we all seem to be at the same kind of point where we're trying to do things, but we don't really work together too much. And I think there's a there's a huge kind of opportunity there for us to all collaborate and work together, you know, little organizations and, and some of the bigger ones that we all know of. I mean, how how do you kind of see that? We try, we try really hard. Yeah. Um, and we do, like behind the scenes, we talk to lots of various organizations. You know, I am regularly in contact with people at different organizations that we try to collaborate. Um, you know, it's we get information given to us from various sources, mm-hmm. right. um, which we then then use to inform our research and vice versa we pass on information that we think will be useful to others um i think i think that what does happen i don't think it necessarily has to be visible in the form of you know two logos being stuck together in a tweet posted on twitter so it's working Um, in the background is what you're saying Yeah. yeah yeah definitely i think so um you know i think we all have different niches and expertise um and we try not to to step outside of our wheelhouse, I guess. We know, you know, what we are good at. We're good at information mm. and we're good at research. Um, we're not necessarily good at, well, not that we're not good at, but our purpose isn't to, to try and, you know, do the activist work that a lot mm. of organisations do to actually turn this into, into policy or into protest. Um, mm. You know, and so we try and... Um, we try and work with organisations who who do want to do that stuff by passing on our information and going, right. here you are, this is yeah. what we have. Um, we hope it's useful um, yeah. and vice versa. If they come across information in the form of their activism, they, they don't know what to do with. Yeah, so it's, it's good yeah. to hear that that is going on because, it, yeah. it you know, it, it does feel sometimes like the, a lot of, you know, working isolation more than we should be. We should be collaborating as much as we, we can. Feel quite well. lonely, can't we? Yeah, exactly. I, I felt like that. I feel like I, why is nobody listening to this? Why? Yeah. Because it feels like you're banging your head on the table. It's like people are being attacked. Why? You know, and and I've had these. I've mithered people when I think, oh God, they're going to think I'm absolutely balmy. But sometimes I'll email journalists and I say, please, can you? draw some attention to this but they don't know who i am that you know i don't i don't have that kind of clout you see to get so that's what i've tried to do you know build up a bit of a twitter and stuff like that but increasingly i find that i'm the kind of conversations that i'm having on social media especially just spiral into pettiness and i've, I've had to learn because that because i can be quite reactionary i can be quite <laughs> really you know people can <laughs> you might have noticed um and, and I, you know, when people try and harm you just for speaking, I, I don't have a big profile. I've got quite a small profile. But even that, people people like certain lobby groups have, have targeted me. And I'm like, oh, my God. So imagine if you had, you know, if you were quite a, quite a well-known person and you, you would like, I sometimes think about India Willoughby. I mean, I don't always agree with everything India Willoughby says, but I'm thinking if you were somebody like that, you'd have to have somebody look after you all the time because you know i know people you know when people i mean the turfs talk about death threats all the time but i I mean that's vexation as far as i'm concerned on twitter but i know people that have had to the personal addresses and and workplaces death threats and so it's like so frustrating it must be frustrating for you when you see people when you see people you know are harmed in the street you know so yeah so um, yeah, so you know, I've not got a huge profile, but um, yeah. I have done some reporting on things that people didn't want to be reported on, and yeah. that has led to attempts to dox me, hmm. attempts to find where I live by Kiwi Farms. Oh yeah, um, oh. you know, it has resulted in physical violence in the form of me being at the Honor Oak, um, and subsequent to that, significant harassment and Turning Point UK publicly posting pictures yeah. of me to yes, try and incite harassment against me. You know, it's um, yeah, it's not fun. Kind of target, yeah. It's yeah. not fun, and as I say, I'm I'm quite small profile. But- um, it's I think I think the problem is is also you know, 
it, it feels quite lonely and that that's true and I, I think the problem is also that we as a as a community we fundamentally lack resources mm. you know so every bit of time that someone gives up to collaborate on a project or work together or to do research or whatever it is is usually time being given up from someone who doesn't have much time to begin with yeah. you know all of us you know um all of us all of us at tsn and certainly most of us doing this kind of work i think have day jobs that mm-hmm. we're trying to yeah. do this on top of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um we have families and lives and friends and things that we'd actually like to be able to enjoy but we don't get to because very often you know when I should be spending time with my partner, I'm up in the middle of the night writing an article on something horrendous. Um, mm. When I should be doing something nice, I'm traveling to London to get attacked. You know, mm. it's... Um, yeah, and I, it, I was going to bring that up because you must sometimes feel like you have to shut it off and then come back to it because like um, there, something will happen and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is happens to us all, like where you have that, I need to just shut social media down I need to have some of me time because like you say a lot of the people against us they have a lot of resources they have a lot of money if they at their disposal mm. like these they, they can make that their full-time job to lobby the government to to go into places where we don't have the, even if we had the money don't have the time and it's like i've noticed uh i don't know if i got the facts right this you you did you met, meet with the ehrc um i met with a representative from the un that was the that's right victor victor madrigal that was it right. yeah that's, sorry i forgot the name yeah so I, I would like to know a little bit more about that because i know they'd been he'd been uh commenting on the state of the ehrc was it that uh well I victor's that right. report was really yeah, that, was really yeah great. He, i really enjoyed reading it was that. damning victor was absolutely fantastic to mm. meet um and it was he he um he's a lawyer by training himself so when i met him and i um was trying to communicate effectively how gender critical movement is attempting to weaponize human rights mm. against uh, against human rights mm. in this country um he just understood everything instantly that i was trying to communicate um which was like so it was such a relief really refreshing isn't it yeah, yeah um and and one of the most you know i think Im- important things was there was no I feel like when you're trying to talk to to people in this country who aren't trans or aren't very involved in this work it feels like you're trying to explain something mm. that that they just can't grasp yeah you, um, you feel like you need to bang your head on the wall a few times to try yeah and- and it's, it, and it's and it's not just once it's yeah. you know it's like so many people don't understand some really basic issues and yeah, i think yeah, i think people I, I think people even genuinely well meaning people just do not understand mm-hmm. the level of the attack yeah that we that we are facing like and it can make you i think i think i think you often are very afraid of coming across as like over being overly dramatic or yes, whatever. I certainly feel like that. <laughs> oh, you know, we like, get accused of doing that regardless. You know? well, I'm you know, quite, you... I'm, although I am quite dramatic. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be accused of being hysterical, effectively. Oh, gosh. Well, that's right? misogyny, isn't it? So. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, a yeah. lot of it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I spoke to Victor and he... I, I instantly felt that there was no mm-hmm. worry about having to try and convince him Mm. that what the t- stuff we were talking about was very serious mm. he just knew it was right mm. like he 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 was incredibly concerned from that's the really, things he had heard that's really um, good to know actually because i obviously like you were there at that in that time so i mean I, abs- absolutely amazing that you made that journey to do that so thanks for you know doing you that. know and it was you know i spent hours and hours up in the night preparing stuff <laughs> to happen to give to him um, you know, as I say, I did this all out of my time. Yeah. I should be sleeping, not out of, yeah. you know, I wasn't getting paid. It's been exhausting. It it is exhausting. It's exhausting all of the time. I often just wonder, like, effectively, it's a matter of time until I have a breakdown. Oh, well, like well, you know, I was but... going to ask you: Have you got? You must have a support. You must have a good support network. I hope you do because 
you know, if because uh, I think sometimes like we, we know each other kind of online and I know quite a lot of trans people, but sometimes when I'm, I feel like I can't reach out because they've got their own things going on. And if I start, mo I feel like I'm moaning about this or something's happened, like sometimes something will happen online and, and there'll be a pile on. And it feels like, and I, I don't want to drag anybody else into this because, you know, that's, that's how you feel. But this this situation you put yourself in of meeting somebody from the UN, I mean, I think that's absolutely amazing, you know. And I mean, it is exhausting. It is very stressful for some of the stuff we, we do. I mean, I think it's really important that you, you know, you take breaks when you when you can. I'm very terrible at taking breaks. You should definitely Like, I am that. absolutely awful at it. But to be fair, I have been my whole life. Mm. um so i have adhd right. and i was gonna uh, ask you are you a bit like me because i sometimes i'm like power 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 through yeah, things free, when freed is texting me it's like it's like a machine uh, gun going off it's like and then yeah, and then suddenly slower. i'll hit a wall and everything is like it feels like everything's dead heavy all of a sudden and i don't know if you can you relate to that a little bit yeah yeah so i have to work in bus yeah right? and right. I, I i have to work in i can't do like a you sit at your desk at nine o'clock in the morning and you tippy tap <laughs> until five. I have to work in silly um, and then sort of just collapse for a bit mm. afterwards. Um, and, you know, like my whole life, like I, the worst part of my life was always like at school and whatever. It was always mm. the summer holidays because I was always just really bored and there was nothing worse for me than mm. boredom. So effectively, you know, if I can never take a break in the sense mm -hmm. of, oh, I'm just going to relax and do nothing. Mm -hmm. I have to find a slightly less traumatic task right. to take up my time yeah. as but an alternative. A, I mean, like don't, don't feel guilty about taking breaks. Take them, you know, just go, go and mean, take a break. But I know, I know when somebody says that to me, I'm, like, I'm in the zone now. I've got to do it now because if I don't do it now, I forget. I'll forget what it is I'm thinking about. And I, you know, people make notes. I don't really make notes because it has to happen now because it's in my mind now so yeah I'll, I'll i'll be awake at three o'clock in the morning and it's like the magic roundabout music going round in my head you know so sometimes I'm sometimes like if i have like if something finally comes together and i've got like the idea for an article or, or something happens right so like a legal case just drops yes, like yes. the way my brain works is that i just have to just do that do it until right it's now. done yeah. yeah and then and then it's done and then I can rest. But until it's done, my brain won't stop. Yeah. It's 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 not healthy, but it is the only way my brain works. So. If, 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 what, if that works for you, yeah. But I've, yeah, make sure you take I've, the breaks too. Yeah. I've done this thing where I've like I've been on Google Docs and I've not realized what time it is, and I've messaged Vicky and go, Can you read this? And it's like she's she's asleep. <laughs> why, why would she yeah, be awake? It's like three o'clock in the morning. I was like, I, 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 oh got... yeah, I I send all my emails and everything like that at like two o'clock in the morning when I'm lying in bed and <laughs> unable to sleep. And I just write and, include like an apology, and... like sorry, this was sent at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but... Sorry for waking you up in the middle of the night. Another thing with me, I've got like I, I've I've learned myself to sort of spell because I had like serious dyslexia, and also I've got a kind of keyboard dyspraxia so i'm writing that fast and then i look at the screen and go that's not what i thought of <laughs> so, you should yeah. get dictation software it really helps uh, yeah i do I, mean, I might have to do that so we've gone off a bit of a tangent there we we? so I, I, the other thing just to bring it back to your work because we, we've talked a lot about trans obviously because that's part of, a massive part of what you do but can we talk a bit more about your work with disabilities because that's where i have a few blind spots and and i think because did you say that was how you started off with research? Yeah, so um, it's still a big component of what I do in my, mm. you know, in my studies, in my research. Um, like the last article I published was a, a review of, of a, a book about disability. Um, mm. You know, um, it's, and I feel like the two are so connected in ways mm. in which like, neither dis the disabled community nor the trans community mm. properly um understand and if i have a personal project i guess it's probably to um apply more of a disability like lens to how we think about a lot of trans politics because mm. i do think it is you know um with a lot of the problems in in in, in our discussions i think it, it it helps open up quite a few of those those problems and helps unpack them um so yeah I've 
I've, I've I've been a disabled activist first and foremost. Like I had the reason why I'm only doing my masters now, um, is because I had to take um a year out in the middle of my undergrad degree and redo a whole year, um, because I was just so ill. Like um, I had a complete collapse and I had to I had to take time out and you know it was it was during that experience um that I got really involved in disability politics that I started to understand mm. my life through a disability politics lens mm. um so like the most important thing in disability pro- politics probably is like the social model and that I think can be applied to so much other stuff Mm. not just disability which is basically it um to put it to put it in a metaphor if you are someone who uses a wheelchair Mm. and you need to get into a building and there are a big big flight of stairs in front of you and you can't get up and in um the social model says that disability is not the fact that you can't walk up those stairs Mm. Disability is the fact that those stairs are in your way and that there isn't a ramp or a lift. Yes. Yeah. It puts it positions the 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 core of the oppression of disabled people yeah. in you know the the fact that society is not built for us. Mm. Um and I think you know that that can be so so useful for trans politics and for queer politics more broadly you know That's... when we think about like the ways in which our experiences of, of like gender dysphoria or our ac- needs to access healthcare, if we situate those problems not as like personal problems that are like intrinsic to us but instead are situated in our relationship to society and the way mm. that society is built i think it can like give us a lot of clues about what the answers are yeah that sounds like because with my job because you like with I, I can't really talk too much detail about what I do but disability is part of that but it's always seen as like because moving people around as if they're a load mm-hmm. and I have a sometimes you know if, if somebody's immobile that you might have to think like that but a, a lot of people apply that kind of logic to every situation so the person is something that needs to be moved <laughs> do you know what I mean so I've had this these situations where you know somebody might be in a wheelchair and I know how I didn't realize how difficult that was until I started to work with people like that because you'd go to like a health center this is a health center and find there was no easy way to get a wheelchair in and I was like something as simple as that and it's like and that 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 is somewhere where you'd absolutely expect there to be help but there wasn't and and people kind of prioritized the wrong way so not only are they making life difficult for the individual in a wheelchair but it but it makes it would it would help everybody if we you know like it's like the idea of the high tide lifts all boats but Mm -hmm. obviously this comes down to money unfortunately and with the nhs we know how bad that is um you know that Another thing I was thinking about, especially with the trans, to bring it back to trans a little bit, it's often talked about in a psychological profiling kind of way. And I really detest that because in sometimes in arguments on social media, it's, oh, you need to see a psychiatrist. And it's like, well, actually, do you know what? I did. And I saw a psychologist or I saw a counsellor and a therapist. And I think perhaps you could benefit from that, maybe. But it's like this weapon of psychology you need you need the psychology like it's, it's already built into the language that that is a weapon and it's so destructive it's like so i'm sure you you come across that in these kind of conversations yeah so the book i i was talking about that i reviewed was mad world by misha fraser carroll um and it's talking about how like mental illness madness are actually like socially constructed categories that mm. are used to decide you know, which ways of thinking, which ways of moving through the world are, like, unacceptable. And, you know, that that's 100% key to, like, how trans people have been oppressed, right? Like, it's this idea of, uh, of, of our brains as in ones that need diagnosing, that need mm. treatment, rather than 
us being you know I like to think of it I like to think of transness often as to like a neurodiversity framework yeah I do yeah yeah you know of like actually like I've just got a brain that works in a bit of a different way um and society should be built in a way that allows allows for that plurality of like being um you know rather than being centered around the neurotypical person or the cis person Mm -hmm. where everything is just assumed that you know all jobs are assumed that people work in a nice nine to five work yeah. pattern, which yeah. makes it, you know, Im- impossible for like mm. me to, to try and that find comes like out, that, that comes out the industrial revolution of everything being sort of time monitored and the clock is the, the rule. Yeah, You should read Mike Oliver. Uh, Mike I Oliver will, talks exactly about that. I, I will. Uh, I was, this, this made me just think of the, you, know, you, you, you definitely will be aware of Helen Joyce. And she, mm-hmm. she made that statement about uh, uh, trans people, but I, I'm paraphrasing, but trans people being a problem in a sane world. And the, the thing that stuck out to me wasn't the trans problem, but the sane world. Because yeah. what world does she want? Because yeah. her sane world is the world that's in her brain. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's the problem. Not, I mean, it's all a problem. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but that was the thing that struck out to me because that she's got an idea of a sane world. Yeah, well, think about that. It's like who think, who owns the definition? You know? Yeah. Think about the horrors that happen in our mm. supposedly sane world under mm. the lens of rationality. Mm. Think about the people who were murdered and tortured mm. and and whose lives are left in poverty and deprivation mm. under the well, sanity and rationality of mm. say the market. Or you know the free market. Well, I've got a. I, what what I, is sanity? I was going to just bring this up because I think it's important. But I had a brother who was schizophrenic, mm-hmm. and he was he was diagnosed schizophrenic because he went to prison, and he was you know the doc the doctors there, and it was on his medical record schizophrenic. And when everybody I told people about you know I I was, I, I was young so I didn't really fully understand it, but I'd noticed them back away from him and because it was on his medical record for forever. Whenever he went to hospital, even if he was just going for a checkup for something nothing to do with, they would they would see schizophrenic and treat him. Now, he did, he did have behavioural problems. I'm not denying that. But it was the way that they singled him out as somebody that was going to be a, a definitely be a problem because they'd seen this word. And I don't know, what, even to this day, I don't know what that word means. Even if, if I read every book about it, I I don't think I would know, but that's a word that carries so much weight, and it's a weapon as far as I'm concerned. And I was wondering how you feel about that. Is that? Yeah, these labels are also. It's important to note that these labels are disproportionately attached to people of color, to to women. Mm, yes. You know, like borderline personality disorder is, and the effect that that has had on on women is something that you could, and there has been yeah. many books written about. It's um. It's a tool of discipline, of um, marking certain people mm. as as other, as danger, as undeserving. Mm. Um, it's like the word think... hysterical itself comes from that mm-hmm. idea. It's, yeah, it's, it's hysterical is the idea that your womb moves yeah. around in your body <laughs> and it yeah. affects your brain. Um, yeah, it's it's all uh, of these things. Are all and these are the same people together. that would use the phrase biological reality and things like mm-hmm. that because... It's like it's like I think there's a sort of need in in some people to simplify everything because they feel like right I know about it now I don't have to think about it anymore. So once they have a handle on something, it's very hard for them to break that because they feel like they've un- understood something. So so if they think biology is immutable, if they think sex is binary, that'll do, you know, because everybody that that's the accepted thing. It's like recently Richard Dawkins was talking to some of these people and he's he's talking about, oh, you can't change sex. But I'm not arguing that. I don't actually care about that. I want you to accept me as I am in society. I'm a social being. I'm not a bio, I'm not a collection of body parts. And I think that's the thing they miss. Yeah. I think, I think there's also a disproportionate focus on sort of like the metaphysics Mm. of what it really means to to be a woman or whatever. And frankly, I couldn't care less. Well, it's, it's like, like these... most people couldn't care less. Like it's it's more interesting. Like okay, what are the consequences yes, of, yeah, of, I... of that? Like what what does that mean, I mean for I... 
how we go around in society. I was going to say, you know, because I am I am fascinated by philosophy and I love to philosophize. But when my friends are getting beaten up on the street, that's not philosophy. They're not getting beaten up because they've got a philosophical belief about what a woman is. They're getting beaten up because they they look different. And the person beating the person doing the aggression, I, a couple of friends of mine were spat on on a tram in Manchester. The people doing that just recognize that there's a target. And for whatever reason, those football lads would be the same people that would attack somebody for any different, they could like the thing, we talk about this a lot, but what happened with Sophie Lancaster. And that's the driver. It's this thing that they found something that they can't understand or they don't, they, they can single out. And I don't think it's got anything to do with whether you're trans or not. I think it's they've found something that is incongruent to their brain because society you know, rewards that almost rewards those thoughts because it's, I think it comes down to misogyny again, because a lot of those misogynistic behaviors are historically rewarded, aren't they? That's what it feels. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it is it is literally rewarded in that yeah. patriarchy, you know, gives power yeah. to some and denies it to others. And yeah. so it's in, you know, it's it's showing people the levers that they can press, the buttons they can push um, to 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 enforce power over others mm. and saying go ahead and, and of course they do because it's in their own interest to do it mm. um you know it's people people benefit I, I think this is often forgotten um people often think of the hatred of, of trans people as rooted in a sort of irrational hatred mm. whereas it's not a, an irrational hatred it's it's at the very least in in, in a broader sense it's an entirely rational um decision to deny yes. power to some in mm. order to give that power to others mm. and you know um i think i've i've made i've said that and i think when i've said that you're being irrational what i'm trying to do is make an excuse for their behavior so they'll not beat me up <laughs> so hard do you know what i mean so i kind of like will subconsciously kind almost subconsciously take on that misogyny so because i want to be protected so if i went everywhere and asserted myself, I know I'd probably be in trouble pretty quickly. So when I said to people, you're being irrational, it's like, I know what I'm saying, but I, I've got to survive the conversation in a, in a sort of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I think that's entirely, you know, that makes sense. Because mm. it, it mm. you know, at the very least in how they express themselves, how mm. they conduct themselves, it can, mm. it can feel irrational, the way that the, yes. they contradict yes. themselves, the yes. way that they don't make sense. But it all makes sense when it's seen as well, part of the broader it, picture. I mean, it shouldn't make sense that somebody like Nigel Farage gets so much media attention, but it does because the the, the society rewards that kind of nonsense, you know. So uh, none of this happens by accident. And you see, yeah. obviously, the media is complicit because obviously, with I mean, I I, I think GB News specific specifically seem very keen on pushing. I mean, I'd call it fascism. Actually, I was gonna, I was gonna call it patriarchy, but I would actually go as far. Some of the things I've heard just this week, because I do mon- I watch it because I monitor it, and I, because I like, I write about it. And interestingly, like my part, people in my family read the Daily Mail and watch that kind of stuff. And there's always so many times I say, "Can you not buy that?" But it's so ingrained in their life that it. It, for them it feels like why are you telling me what to read they're telling it's them that's telling you what to read not me <laughs> you know yeah. so that's it yeah, really. this kind of takes us on to that topic of you know activism and its effectivity and um you know frida frida's done a few appearances on things like talk tv and mm. gb news and stuff like that um i was just wondering jess what do you what do you think about those kind of right-wing shows what's your opinion on them I have a I have a mixed opinion. I was sometimes when Frida does, I think, oh, I wish she wouldn't do that. And then other times, I'm thinking, well, Frida's the only voice there doing it. You know, you, you've got to you've got to stand in the way of those of those voices sometimes. I think I've spoken to Frida about this before. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Which mm. is that I don't I don't see the utility in it, right? Mainly because um, there's a particular editorial line that you just can't yeah. get around exactly. like if yeah. if they're gonna show they'll show whatever they want to show I mean, there is can, no they do offense. use it against you afterwards they will yeah. edit it they will clip it yes, they will absolutely. misrepresent yeah. it they yeah. will do whatever yeah. they can to get across 
their goal. Like yeah. you, you're trying to you're trying to play the house. Well, I right? like, I stopped. Yeah, yeah. I you're stopped. not going to win. See, the reason yeah. I've stopped is because the talking points have not evolved. What it doesn't matter how many times I tell them that oh, trans no, women are not are not taking over it. sport, and I explain why the the main thing for me to say is why are you having this conversation now? Who does it benefit? And they, they're not interested, obviously, they're not interested in that. So the same subjects come up again, and then they'll ring me saying, can you come and talk about this? I said, I already talked to you about that. You didn't listen last time. So <laughs> I've, you know, I didn't really, not that I expected them to, but I thought, well, there's no point in doing it again. So like, I think, like, I, I had the experience of, like, trying to, I think, it, it's like sometimes I'm my own worst enemy because <laughs> I'm quite gobby and I can be quite reactive. And obviously, I, you know, I've I've managed to get on, but it's it's like a photo booth. It's so easy to get on those shows. It's not like some accomplishment, and I've realised that. But um, I still, I mean, like I, I was listening to LBC today, and Robin Moy Wright was on there, and the subject was about the Costa cartoon, uh, the trans man thing, and I just think this is just another one. That the, the actual subject matter isn't what they're interested in. They're interested in the culture war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was really nice actually to hear Robin speak because she actually understood that she just wants to talk about trans men and why why people are tracking them. So yeah, as you know, I understand. I understand. You know what what you just said, <laughs> Jess. But I I also see it from the other side where you know if they're going to have a show and talk about these stuff, maybe it's a good idea to have a trans voice on there especially yeah, when it's a live absolutely. show, because you can make some really, as long as you stick to your points and make your points strongly in a live show, they can't edit that out. Well, you know, I, so yeah, you, gonna... there, there are some kind of opportunities to, to yeah. make points, but I, I also I just thought of you know, see that because... point that you make about how it's used against us at the same yeah. time. So it's a bit of a... But what, what I noticed, Vicky, sort of. is by watching these things, I was mani- I, I was able to notice who were the lobby groups and who were the people because i'd look i'd read i'd search for them and they'd all be coming from the same offices in westminster and also the thing that really made it wasn't the trans issue it was just stop oil that made me realize it's the same people it's the same office and that and i thought they're not but that's when the penny dropped because like they're not bothered about trans issues that even if they they just hate anything that is taken away from yeah. there um you know whoever's funding them that that's where their interest is so they want to destabilize you know the left or whatever so, it is. yeah i mean let, let's talk about activism and protest and and you know what do we think about that and what 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 do you think is a really kind of effective kind of activism and protest because you know you can you can go and do these protests and uh you know you, sometimes you have to be aware of the consequences i mean what, what's your view so I'm just a researcher. Yeah. I'm not here to tell anyone <laughs> yeah. what to do with their Nicely time Dutch. and their lives. <laughs> yeah, I think the yeah. Uh... But if if I was to, you know, briefly venture, um I'd say that, you know, a plurality of approaches works and mm-hmm. I think is useful. Um mm. I, I think, think where we've where we've come to with it is that, you know, everybody do what you're comfortable doing. Well, you know, I think that's where I'm at with it. We interviewed Ali, is it Rabashkin, who who famously threw the tomato juice on Kelly J. Keane. And listening, I don't know if you listened to that podcast, but listening to her story, and because she'd been a refugee, if a family had, you know, been uh, Holocaust survivors, and she had this whole history, and she kept uh, kind of ephemera and objects from her past. And it, and, it, and it was only like at the end of the interview, she really talked about why she did the action. And, and I thought, well, you know, if you're somebody like her and fascists are turning up in your town all the way, they traveled 13,000 I mean, yeah, miles. Based on what she's been through throughout her whole thinking, life. Oh my God. That, well, that little just, incident at the end was, just, was, was pretty much nothing for her, you know. But 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 that maybe th- when when they came to Manchester, I thought that what they're doing on my there was a very yeah. territorial feeling, yeah. you know. I'd, and I've never felt like that before about a place, but because those people who'd only come to cause trouble came to Manchester, and Manchester to me had always been a place of an escape from my town to to go and have a good time or to mm. to be accepted. To have them come up, I thought, oh my gosh, well, 
I started to think about doing something, you know, but I, you know, we, we've talked about this before, Vicky, about, you know, protests and what we could do, but uh, yeah, I don't know if it, cause like I, cause I don't, I wouldn't want to put my job at risk and things like that. Uh, so. Yeah. I, I seriously think it's, you know, each to their own assess the risks, you know, do what you're prepared to do and, you know, stay safe. If you, if you are going to do it, it will come for you though. I mean, it's like, the, yeah, the this is the thing. There's going to be, and... people will come after you for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's also worth knowing that like respectability politics won't protect yeah, you that's true i think that's a lesson our community needs to learn um if it ever will it's quite but scary. there there are a few people in our community who are very willing to throw people under the bus and i think you know i understand the instinct right of the fear that anything we do as a community or individuals in our community do will instantly be weaponized against us. Mm. But it's also worth knowing that because of the, what the motivation for this is, like the motivation for um, the attacks on us aren't the things we do. It's the ideology. Yeah. It's the, it's the power they're trying to maintain and enforce. So it literally doesn't matter what we do. We could do nothing. We could do everything, and we will get the exact same response. Wow. So it's it's not worth um, wringing uh, hands over what different methods people choose mm, to adopt to try and fight yeah, back. I feel that. Yeah. I I think it's it's more worth. I I think talking might... about how we can um mm. you know make sure that everyone is equipped with the skills and information they need to do whatever it is they want mm. to do. And we know the government that well. We know that there's certain forces that are trying to clamp down on protests. We know we know what happened during the coronation. Mm -hmm. I've seen just a oil protesters punched in the street recently, and the media celebrates this. It's if yeah. it's and it's and so so I'd always protest because to lose that right to protest. So, I mean, I'm not talking about a direct action where somebody's you know throwing soup at somebody, for example, but just being on the street, I think, is enough. You know, just because if uh, and it feels like for trans people and, and non-binary people, there's just not enough of us in numbers. So we need to get those cis allies because that mm. is the only way that we could change, you know, the conversation. So I think when I when I have been on GB News or Talk TV or whatever, LBC, um, I felt like I'm I'm talking to somebody in my family because like, I have got family members that think they don't necessarily, I, I would, it, a right wing but they observe they up they absorb that kind of media so yeah. that's my motive that was my motivation to get in the way of but even even that like even like when i talk to family members they'll be like oh why are you wasting your time <laughs> you know what i mean like don't you know so it can be quite a thankless task <laughs> yeah as i say if, if if i believe in anything i believe in a plurality of different methods mm. And not yeah. putting all of our eggs in one basket as a community. There are lots of different things we can be trying. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point you make. Yeah, so I think I think we've covered quite a lot there, Jess. It's really fantastic and fascinating. Just absolutely wonderful to talk to you finally and listen to you talk about the work you do. Because just from me, it's really appreciated. And I know that a lot of trans people, a lot of you know, just people that are interested in what the far right are doing in this. Yeah. They really appreciate what you do, and I know sometimes yeah, you might um, not feel you might not feel that, but they do. Yeah, you know, Trans, Trans Safety Network does some amazing work. You know, I've I've read a lot of the stuff that you put on social media. You know, I, I do try and keep up with it all. It's um doing a great job, really. Well, thank you. It's, so, is there, is there anything else you'd like to add that we've not covered? I, I was not just like wondering. Oh, okay. You know, do do you have a do you have a message? For the trans community, what would you oh, that's say? That's a big one. If you could address the entire trans community, is there an entire? Trans... Trans... Yeah, is there an entire trans community? Probably not. I'm just, you know, <laughs> it's a nebulous community. That's what it I'm is. Saying. That's a. Right, yeah. Imagine the the word nebulous is a good word. That. <laughs> um, God, what would I say? What, what um, would you say? It's a bit of an on the spot kind of question. It is. I know I'm putting <laughs> you. On, I'm putting you on the spot there, but you know, we do ask that question to our guests. You know, do you have a message for the trans community? I mean, you know, we are under so much kind of stress and, you know, strain at the moment with everything that's going on. We need to look after each other. Yeah. And there are lots of different ways to do that. 
keeping ourselves informed, keeping ourselves safe. Mm. Things like mutual aid, things like just being there to talk to each other when we need it. The way we get through this is by surviving this, yeah. first and foremost. So the first and most important thing we need to do is look after each other. I agree yeah. with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nice Good message. message. Yeah. So, and I really, I really like that. You know that thing we were talking about where we, the collaboration. That's my, yeah, it's one of my things. Oh, I think uh, have you got any thing to add, Vicky? Because I think it's time for the song. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I think it's getting very close to the time for the song. Yeah, do you want to I mean, do you want to give us a little demonstration for you know, just to get us well, you know into yeah, the Yeah, I, I usually do one. I just do it once and then we just copy it after three. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it's don't forget to subscribe. So I just count three, and don't worry, nobody ever gets it right. <laughs> Well, I know. So, are you, are you ready, about? Vicky? Yeah. No, you yeah. always get it wrong. Right. Are you ready? One, two, three. Don't, Don't forget, forget to, to subscribe. subscribe. <laughs> that was the worst, yeah. <laughs> that was good. You were, you were out of tune, Frida. Um, yeah. What can I say? I need to do my scales. <laughs> Well, thank so Jess, you, Jess. Thank you. Yes. We'll thank you so much there. for coming on and, and having uh, a little chat with us. Thanks um, for listening. Thank you for having me. For anybody who's listening or watching, please subscribe, like, come back and listen to our conversations again. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you very Bye. much. We'll see you, see you next time. <laughs>